Okay, great. It's uh, terrific to be here today. Um, I want to thank the organizers for this um, opportunity to present today. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, 3D retinal organoids and uh, modeling eye development and disease. Uh, so this is an example of an eye. Um, light passes through the, the lens here. It falls on a, a thin film of tissue in the back called the retina, which is composed of a variety of different neurons. You have photoreceptors on one side, both rods and cones. You have interneurons uh, here in the middle and then ganglion cells, which ultimately send signals to the brain. So there are a lot of different um, retinal degenerative disorders, uh, including AMD, 200 million people uh, worldwide, RP, 2 million, LCA, another 200,000 there in glaucoma, it's 80 million, so that's a lot of people um, that are gonna have permanent visual impairments. So there's a lot of things that we can do with uh, organoids in order to model retinal degenerations and tackle this problem. Uh, for example, we can screen for neuroprotective drugs uh, in order to block the disease before it becomes a real problem. Uh, we can study the disease. We can find targets to, tar uh, to go after. And we can make new retinal cells for transplantation. Um, sort of related to that is there the possibility to restore uh, retinal function and form uh, through endogenous repair. So really the goals of what we're interested in are improving the reliability, reproducibility, and efficiency of generating 3D organoids in culture. And so we want more reliable 3D models so we can look at photoreceptor development, ganglion cell development. Uh, we want to develop new tools so we can image these cells as it's forming. And we want to utilize small molecule screens to improve the efficiency of this process. So all of this kind of leads into the long-term goal of having diseased models which are actually relevant and reproducible. And so for that, we really need better developmental models. So the... Uh, the system that we're talking about today um, has been around for about six years. Uh, it's been slowly improving every year. There's new improvements. Uh, back in 2011, Jason Myers from David Gam's lab, they showed that you can get these uh, vesicular structures with retinal cells included. Uh, they weren't very well organized. Um, that came a little bit later in the Sasai lab from Nakano et al. Uh, they showed that you can get photoreceptors on the outside of this structure, and it began to laminate, a very Im important observation. Uh, not too long after that, others have shown that you can get some degree of functionality, uh, light responsiveness. And in this past year, we described um, our system, which develops outer segments um, quite well. So the way that this system works is we use a forced aggregate approach where you take dissociated cells, you put them in a little round bottom plate, and as you can see here, they form a nice spherical structure. Every single well has a single unitary sphere, so it's very reproducible. Uh, within about 10 days, you see these very nice vesicles which have formed. So some of them become retinas, some of them become non-retinas, presumably uh, forebrain-like properties. Uh, the system that we use uh, uses Wnt inhibition at early stages, a uh, hedgehog signaling slightly later, and then even later, we block notch signaling in order to improve the yield of photoreceptors. So once we have these vesicles, we have to isolate them. Um, this actually looks more challenging than it is. Um, each of these structures is about 500 microns, and you can actually get probably about five or six of these per minute. So if you have a 96 volt plate, it takes a few hours, it's a little bit of work, uh, but in the end, you result, uh, the result is that you have a lot of these structures to play with. Um, eventually, you're gonna have to throw out a lot of these that don't meet your strict quality control, but, um, but we have a lot of tissue to work with, so that's okay. Uh, within a month or so, we see a lot of lamination occurring. We see. OTX2 positive progenitor cells. So these are migrating. Presumably these are photoreceptors. Uh, we see a ton of brain three positive ganglion cells here. And then just beneath the retina, we see a nerve fiber layer here. It does not form an optic nerve. It forms something more like a, a, a disorganized bundle of axons which sits inside of the organoid. Um, so in the future, we would love to have the system where we can actually guide them outside of the spheroid. That would be pretty cool. And I think most exciting for me, since I'm really more interested in photoreceptors, is the observation that we can get both rods and cones in the same system. We don't get a macular or fovea, uh, but we do get both cell types, and we have these uh, robust, exuberant uh, inner and outer segment structures here. And so they, they grow to about 45 microns. They don't grow beyond that. They somehow become self-limited. They know to stop growing. Uh, and this happens even in the absence of RPE cells, which I find pretty surprising. So, um, these pictures show a lot of organization, but the fact is these cultures also have a lot of variability. So I think everybody in the field is struggling with this problem, and it's something I think we can probably address. So the way we're approaching this problem is through gene editing. So generating reporters is probably 
Um, the number one thing I think we can do to monitor the, the general status of the cells as we're growing them. And the CRISPR-Cas9 system, I think probably everybody here knows what this is. Um, probably most people have even used it. It's uh, incredibly easy to use. Um, there's many advantages. It's, it can be clonally isolated, easy genetic manipulation, and cells can be replenished indefinitely. Once you have the cells, you have a, a stock of reporters that you can use for all your experiments. The reporter that we chose is the 6-6 gene. It's a very early I-field gene. It's uh, evolutionarily conserved. You see here in mice and in fish, it's found in the optic um, structures. It's also found in the hypothalamus and pituitary, but for our, our purposes, it's very well suited. So this kind of falls into the um, whole concept of developing a retinal reporter toolbox, where we can have different colored reporters at different stages in growth. So we can have 6-6 six, six positive cells at early stages, we have another reporter, which is slightly after that, which, which is called VSX. We have CRX, early stage photoreceptors. And we're developing other reporters for late stage maturation as well. So we can optimize this process by doing small molecule screens at early stages, mid stages, or late stages. So I really think that this um, fluorescent reporter approach is going to help us kind of hone in some, on some of the problems. So to validate this cell line, we differentiate it with our protocol. And as you can see here, some of the vesicles are GFP positive. Other ones are GFP negative, which uh, is not a big surprise. We already knew that not all these uh, vesicles that we develop are retina. There's, as I said, four brain, and there's uh, retinal structures as well. So usually we'll collect these guys, throw them out, and these guys we'll keep. So the approach that our lab uses is high content imaging. And so the, the basic idea here is that you could have 96 of these samples or more. You can have many plates, um, dozens of plates, in fact, uh, with different experimental parameters. Uh, the microscope will image each of these wells. It will threshold, and it will put values to this. It'll measure uh, intensity or intensity per area, and then it spits out numbers for you. And the advantage here is that it's, uh, it increases statistical significance, and it eliminates human bias, which can be a problem. So with these tools in place, we wanted to address some very basic questions. Uh, we knew that there's a lot of microenvironment changes in the cell culture media, they're probably suboptimal. So we looked at basic things like osmolarity. We know that stem cells grow in high osmolar solution, very easy thing to test. So we, we tested high versus low osmolarity. And in this case, we saw a lot more GFP positive structures. So a very easy thing to test. We also tested the number of cells that we put in the aggregate. Uh, typically, in the literature, people would use between three and 12,000 cells. Uh, we wanted to know how low we can go, because having a, a lower cell number meant that we can scale up more easily. And so actually, we went down from 3,000 to 500, and we saw that 1,000 cells gave us the best GFP signal. So we can scale up quite a bit more now than we could. We also looked at conditions like hypoxia. So I think a lot of times we take it for granted that the uh, microenvironment of the cells that, that they're growing in could have a severe impact. Uh, stem cells typically like to grow under hypoxic conditions. There's less cell death, less stress. Uh, so that's typically how we do it. We wanted to see whether or not we extended hypoxia, whether or not this incre uh, increases uh, the overall vitality of the cells and um, the differentiation process. So we looked at one day, three days, five days, and eight days of hypoxia. Uh, clearly, there are big morphological differences between the structures here. You see more vesicles with the normoxia you see fewer vesicles with hypoxia. But the other flip side of it is that you actually get a lot more GFP signal. So we also were able to use this system to test other microenvironment conditions. Uh, for instance, hedgehog signaling. Uh, we use hedgehog signaling routinely to upregulate 6-6 expression and uh, general retinal induction as well. And so we wanted to test whether or not the concentrations we were using, you know, we take a lot of this for granted, but um, you know, based on the literature, if we used 100 nanomolar, uh, we would have less of a signal than what we currently use. So perhaps the 3D organoids are a little bit different than 2D culture. So all of these things can be tested individually. And the system, we were able to test uh, various hedgehog uh, inhibitors as well. And not surprisingly, uh, the signal goes down in the presence of those inhibitors. So wind signaling is also very important. Um, by blocking wind, we can promote anterior neural development. And so we've, this is a, a compound we've been using for a little while. It's called IWRE1. And, uh, and you know, one of the things here is that we didn't know exactly how long we should be adding this or what doses because we didn't have a good readout. 
In this system, we were able to do a dose response here. And rather than three micromolar, which we previously used, now we use a slightly higher concentration. And we were also able to test issues of timing. Timing is very important for early development. And being off by even a few days could severely impact how organoids develop. And so we tested two days, four days, six, eight, 10 days. And not surprisingly, with extended periods here, we saw greater levels of 6,6 GFP expression. And we did this under a variety of hypoxic conditions as well. And so we always had higher levels in longer periods of hypoxia, as opposed to short periods of hypoxia. So clearly, there's a big role going on here. Uh, we also wanted to know when we should start adding this treatment. Should we add it in the very beginning? We thought, based on our previous results, that we should add it in the very beginning to maximize the amount of anterior neural tissue. But that actually turns out not to be the case. We can add it as late as day four in a two-day period and get better results than if we add it at the earliest time points. So again, another uh, way we were able to optimize the system. So lastly, uh, we know that BMP4 is also very important in eye development. It's basically involved in everything. Um, and in this case here, we tested a dose response. Um, lower doses turned out to be much more favorable to giving 6-6 six, six positive vesicles than higher doses. In fact, the higher doses actually give rise to completely different tissues, uh, in some cases beating cardiac uh, cells and other unwanted tissues. So this system really allows us to test the dosing and timing, osmolarity, hypoxia, growth factors. We looked at hedgehog signaling, BMPs, wind antagonists, and there's a lot of other uh, biomolecules we'd like to test as well, and I think this system uh, will let us do that. So that's the candidate approach. Uh, we also want to discover new things as well. So we can do high content screening with small molecules, which mimic or inhibit bio, uh, endogenous pathways. Um, so the, the good thing here is there's many libraries to choose from. Uh, it's the only um, drawback is the manpower to actually get this work done. So in terms of um, you know, how the general screens work, uh, this is a, an example of a small pilot experiment where we tested about 400 compounds. Um, we did a dose response for each of the compounds. At the highest range here, we often saw toxicity. At the lowest doses, we didn't see any responses. And somewhere in the middle, we would often get some hits. Um, in this particular case, we saw a significant enhancement of 6-6 GFP expression. So this is the target we're going to uh, pursue in the future. So you know, in terms of addressing robustness and reliability, um, everything I just described was with one, one cell line. And one could argue that, that these results could be specific for that cell line. So we're expanding our studies now. We've uh, generated a variety of uh, high-fidelity, TED-inducible um, Cas9-expressing cell lines. Uh, so when we add doxycycline, Cas9 turns on, and we can make um, genomic changes much more readily now. And so we've done that, and we have uh, now rolled out three additional 6-6 GFP lines in different genetic backgrounds. Uh, we're, we've introduced another reporter, which is another early progenitor cell, which is a little bit past 6-6, called VSX2. And as I mentioned earlier, we're also rolling out other stage of reporters as well. So I think that this system here is going to be really helpful for us. Um, incidentally, it's also um, going to be very useful for knockouts as well. So the last thing we're going to talk about is disease modeling. We're just going to go through this quickly. Um, so there's two basic ways that we approach disease modeling in our lab. One is the patient-derived sources, which can be uh, a little bit cumbersome, time-consuming, um, and there's more paperwork involved. Um, but this is one uh, approach. So in this particular case here, uh, we took PBMCs from a, a patient with glaucoma. We isolated these cells. We reprogrammed them with a Sende virus, and then we reprogrammed them um, or gene edited them to include a, a brain three ganglion cell reporter, and then we differentiated them. And so, you know, the, the system is working well. Uh, proof of principle, um, glaucoma related cells uh, can differentiate back into retinas and give ganglion cells. And so, this part was done with uh, Derek Wellsby's lab over at Shiley as well. And in this case, we immunopan some of those cells that came from the brain three positive um, organoid. Uh, we plated them out, and as you can see here, under injured conditions, um, the cells look very poor. Uh, the viability is not good. They're just very stressed. Uh, when we add a neuroprotective compound, there's a significant enhancement in the protection of those cells. So this is an example um, of how we can use um, patient-derived samples and gene editing together 
in order to address these kind of issues. And uh, this kind of approach I should mention also, um, we're using a much larger drug screening approach to identify additional pathways as well. So the last gene that we're interested in is Lieber congenital amaurosis, which is a very early onset retinal degeneration. Uh, it's a genetic condition that causes severe onset, usually by birth or early in childhood, so it's, that's a really unfortunate condition. Um, there are probably 15 mutations which result in LCA, and we've focused on one called CRX. So in this particular example, uh, we used gene editing to uh, cause a small deletion here, which causes a truncation, a premature stop codon, and it disrupts the transactivating domain of this protein here. So CRX is involved in retinal development, and um, it results in a very severe form of um, Lieber congenital amaurosis, so loss of photoreceptors. Uh, so we have isogenic matched for cells for these. Uh, we've rolled out some dual color reporters for these, and we're currently doing some phenotypic studies to look at differences and gene expression changes between those cells as well. So to summarize, uh, we have a system now where we can take pluripotent stem cells, we can grow them into 3D retinas. Uh, these retinas grow outer segments. Uh, a notable feature since a lot of retinal degenerations actually start with a disruption and a, a degeneration of the outer segment. So having these in culture actually helps us with our disease modeling. Uh, we're using gene editing in order to develop different reporters so that we can uh, track and monitor the cells in culture. Uh, we can do the disease modeling much easier with purified batches of cells that we're confident were retinal cells and not other types of neural cells. So I think that's really important as well. And of course the disease modeling now with the reporters will allow us to do some small molecule drug screens to identify new pathways uh, that could result in their protection. Uh, we're not going to talk about this last part, I just want to just brief, uh, briefly touch upon it. There's one other area of 3D organoid culturing, which I think is really exciting and something we're starting to do in the lab, which is endogenous regeneration. And so a lot of animals can actually regenerate body parts. Uh, a, starf a starfish loses its arm, it grows a new one. A lizard loses its tail, not a problem, it just grows a new one. And there's some evidence that fish and other species can do this too. So a zebrafish can lose its eye and grow a new eye. A chicken can lose its eye early in development and grow it back during a certain time. So the time window is important. And there's some evidence that um, some regeneration can happen in, in, in mammals as well. And so we're exploring this possibility now. So with that, I would like to acknowledge some of the people that did the work. And I'll be happy to take any questions. All right, questions for Carl? Um, I was wondering, have you done any functional assays on these retinal organoids? Right, so the functional assays, um, it would take probably about 150 to 200 days. Uh, so it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, I came to UCSD last year, so we're not quite at that point. Um, but in the past, we have done capacitance measurement changes, which suggests that they have a synaptic function. But we haven't actually done patch clamp recordings on, uh, for light responsiveness. But, but that's something we definitely want to do. We actually have somebody in psychology who's uh, all geared up to do that for us. I do have a clarification. I, I, I didn't get if the reporters that you have, it is uh, a full cassette that you just integrate, or these are reporter genes targeted to the downstream of the specific genes. And the second question is, how specific are those genes? Right, okay, so they're integrated right before the stop codon of those genes. Okay. So for 6.6, 6, we put in a P2A sequence and then a fluorescent protein right at the stop site. Okay. So it's not um, inserted into a safe harbor or it's not randomly inserted by lentivirus or some other mechanism. Got it, got it. Um, and the second part How of specific are those markers? Yeah. Um, right, so 6.6 6, um, is an early eye field marker, but it will also label pituitary and hypothalamus. Uh, the next reporter, which is VSX2, it's much more specific. So, yeah, Good. and there, there seems to be a lag of about a week between the time that they're uh, turned on, so it gives us an opportunity to look at gene expression changes that are happening during that time, and we're doing some RNA-seq analysis of some of those time points. Fantastic. Okay. If no other question, we should thank all the speakers, and we have a coffee break now.